welcome to Marin Poets Live. I'm Neshama Franklin. I work at the Fairfax Library and I love poetry. After this program airs on TV, it will appear on the Marin Free Library website as part of a digital archive which also features biographies of the poets and links to our collection. Today we feature poet Andrea Freeman. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Nishan. Did I say it right? Andre Andrea, Andrea, help me. There's four different versions, okay. and I'm the Andrea version. I want to say it right. I say it right to you now. You say it right to me. Read me a Marin poem. I shall. Andrea. So this particular poem, many of my poems are inspired by my experiences in the natural world. And nature is a powerful muse for me. This particular poem was prompted by an afternoon that I spent at Agate Beach, um, which is at this, it overlooks Duxbury Reef, which is the oldest reef in North America, mm. the oldest shale reef in North America. And this whole area is the southernmost tip of the Point Reyes Peninsula, which has a rich and complex geologic history. And the cliffs that are at Agate Beach show millions of years worth of sedimentary deposits from lifetimes past. Mm. And I was sitting there watching the ocean and thinking about all of the lives that had come and gone uh, over these m millennia. And all, it, there's a freshwater stream that spills into the sea right there. So there were freshwater birds and fish, as well as the marine critters that live on the reef. and and there's harbor seals that bask out on the rocks. So anyway, this poem came through inspired by that experience. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, I can recite it by heart. The sediment bottoms of river and sea shorn and shaped into rock from silty and sandy memory pools of otters and urchins and heron dances and salmon spawning in silver and pink-fleshed frenzy and rain dropping dreams on slumbering seals, and worm towers spiring and falling, and scurrying ants carrying seeds hither and thither, flower pollen flung flying and settling, all coalesced now as patchwork coverlets upon each epoch's turning, layer upon layer upturned and upheavaled by colliding plates as earth wails as earth rolls and wind wails and wave churns the passing of millennia into stratified rock. Gull wings glance upon me sitting here now on this wave cut bench of shale, my back leaning against this ancient sea cliff overlooking the glistening water of the ocean coming and going as a shower of rock slivers slide down from the cliff close enough to touch me reminding me that all is still in flux and my body will one day be added to the mosaic mix. So while alive, to add song to the solution born of love, formed and formless. So I rise and walk out the reef to sing a song of love to the turban snails and anemones and the first tide pool sculpin I see. And they were listening, I could tell, <laughs> for you know when you're being heard and they seem to like it. A small agate pebble shone green in the sun at tide pool's edge, tumbled round and smooth by the tide. I slipped it into my pocket like a love note. I'd read with my fingers again and again until I could recite it by heart. Later, I tossed it back into the sea like a message in a bottle for someone else to find, perhaps, many years from now. And when they pick it up, I trust it will have become a singing stone, carrying the very love song they've been waiting to hear, just as it did for me. For that's the way this magic works. That is the way this magic works. That's very, you are an ecstatic poet. <laughs> and you are singing and you are dancing <laughs> while you're writing this poetry. And I happen to live a breath away from Agate Beach, so I know of what you speak. But I didn't know how old it was and how important it was in the great scheme of things. So let's have another poem. Well, this poem 
which is called Murmuration of Starlings, um, was inspired by a walk that I was taking up in the watershed in the hills of Fairfax. And it was near dusk. And a great, huge flock of starlings, who are non-native birds that were imported from England in honor of a fellow in New York who wanted to have all of the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare's plays <laughs> present in New York in Grand Central Park. So the starlings arrived, the starlings have spread, the starlings are now invasive presence, but they're extraordinary flyers. And they fly in great, huge flocks and do aerial ballet, and it's breathtaking to watch. And so I was out walking, and they started pouring in from all directions, and then I wrote this poem. And this one I do not know by heart, so I shall put on my spectacles. Today they came again, the dark-winged gypsies, pouring over the hills in all directions, hearing dusk's call to dance. They glided in as speckled gusts of wind, joining, parting, joining again, then swirled together en masse across the sky, moving as both a particle and a wave like light. They wove the air into a tapestry of wings. <laughs> like light, they painted the air with each brushstroke of wing in great sweeping spirals of synchronized movement, bursting forth and resolving no leader to point the way. They listened to each other, and the current that flows within, moving as one, never missing a beat. With acrobatic grace, they spun and twirled, swinging on aerial trapeze without strings, above the rolling ridge, horizon to horizon, as the trees and audience spotted from below. Coiling and uncoiling, a nebula sung into, into being out of interstellar beaks and wings, now a galaxy of starlings shining upon the pink and lavender space of an evening as the sun set off to light the other side of the world. As I watched, formed out of stardust myself, I considered how foolish it is to think we ever stand alone. Feel the wind of grace encircling you now, they called to me. The cloak of separation fell from my shoulders to the ground. Unfurl your sacred longing like wings. In celebration of the present, ride the waves of joy unfolding in reunion as we fly together across the sky. This is the way ice melts and how water quenches thirst. The starlings fly like this at dusk. Well, you're also a priestess, I believe. Um, and is that one of those collective nouns? Is it the murmuration of starlings? Yes. Yes, because it's yes. such a wild yes. concept. Yes. Yes. It's in, inspiringly beautiful to watch them. Right. And I love the fact that they weren't supposed to be there, and they're a nuisance, and look how beautiful they are. Yes. What a paradox yes. that poetry can embrace more than anything else, I think. Yes. Yes. Another poem, please. A few years back, I decided to go on a, a camping trip down in the desert. And so it was a time of, of great um, challenges and still is on this planet. Uh, it was around the time of um, the, the radiation leak happening from Fukushima, the spill from, there was the Gulf oil spill, there were <laughs> fires raging across the central United States. There were huge hurricanes and floods happening in the south, and I was going, whew, I think I'm going to go meditate in the desert. Mm -hmm. OK, this is, where, this is called wind in the desert. Nothing is superfluous in the desert. The essential thrives with an intelligence that knows how to find water, scarce though it may be, and takes no more than it needs. Calling my heart back to itself between galaxies and granite and the rumblings of the earth, I walked upon this ancient seafloor to listen to the wind, to gaze into the heart of flowers, to confer with the cactus about thorns, <laughs> to see what a lizard sees, to listen to the stories the rocks tell, to invite surprise to emerge from its burrow 
and prance like a prairie dog again. Without artificial light to interfere, the singing of the stars is unmuffled. Even the music from faraway Andromeda tingles the skin. The Big Dipper ladles dreams into a silver trough, large enough to quench even the deepest thirst. Natural rhythm is restored. Equality is a given. Every cactus wears a diadem of flowers and is sovereign where it stands, bowing to no one but the sun. The wind blows in great gusts, carrying ocean memories across the desert. The creosote dances in waves of yellow flowers. The mimulus ripple like a watercolor brushed in crimson across the sand. The choya stands staunch and steady as a sea stack, not wavering. It knows how to survive, and its flowers glow with this knowledge. Death has become a sprinter, running in circles around me with greater frequency, winking around every turn. It could be any time that we link arms and he escorts me off stage. Tornadoes twisting in the east, storms flooding in the south, ice caps melting in the north, faults shaking in the west, fires raging in the center, the black gutted poison of greed spewing into the gulf, radiation seeping from the breech cores of reactors carried by the wind to where I'm sitting now, breathing it all in. How do I make wine out of the madness even still? Oh, dear earth, dear soul, even still. The wind carries secrets that shares in confidences with those who listen. Listening, the wind fingered my hair like a lover, and I took a deep breath. Wind, what are you saying? No words. Just blowing away sorrows and softening the sharp edges that cut and divide. It's spring in the desert. I've come to pollinate the flowers. Look at them. Have you ever seen anything more lovely than these dreams in bloom? You needn't be so strong all the time. Even in your seeming aloneness, I never forget you for even an instant. You can relax into not knowing, and I will catch you in my arms. Sing at dusk with the whippoorwill, and at dawn with the wren. Sing the songs that bubble up from the aquifer. The wine is brewing. Nothing is superfluous in the desert. Yes. Oh, I love the parenthetical lines because the first and the last, you know, just really, really get it. So you were seeking medicine. You found medicine and you gave us medicine in that. And I'm amazed at how you compressed the ills of the, the present ills of the earth into like four lines and didn't let them take over. So that's the, the magic of this work. It's incantory. Yes. And very beautiful. So let's continue. Well, speaking of incantory, now this, this next poem, I like to think of things in a cosmological perspective, from a cosmological perspective. But sometimes I just go walking. And <laughs> I went for a walk late at night one night, and it was a foggy night on the, out in the San Geronimo Valley. And I came home and wrote this poem. That's all I have to say about it. In the beginning was the word, the sound vibration with which the universe hummed itself into being, conjuring a multifarious array of beings to hum along, not in a humdrum sort of way, either. The carabid beetle has determination and dignity as he carts bits of decaying leaves under his dark carapace across the damp duff, humming softly to himself. The bees hum the seductive song of nectar to be tasted, and the satin-petaled flowers hum with colors and sweet scents to draw them near. The birds hum in warbles and trills, carols and cackles, whistles and drones, their vibratory tintinabulation adding octaves to the collective hum. Insect wings whir, motors rumble, cicada spiracles open and close, grasshopper legs draw bow across string. Humpback whales troubadour the ladies in waiting with bardic hums of this year's epic tale. Dolphins giggle 
piccolo and flute orchestral hums. Ocean waves spill onto shore and lap the foam from their humming lips. Clouds hum their way across the sky in billows and wisps as water droplets mingle in reunion after their long voyage to and from the sea, to and from the sea, to and from the sea. Stars hum light into being. Super strings vibrate at the core of every particle. Each layer in the nesting box resonating its frequency like a call note to the universe of I am. The universe is continuing to hum itself into being in each fresh moment. We add to the awakening song with every beat of our heart, every susurration, every thought, word, and deed, every poem. The fog moistens my face and the night wraps its arms around me coaxing me to dream a sweeter dream. These words come as an echo. Humbly I hum, alhamdulillah, alham. Humbly I hum indeed. Now, at the beginning, my mind was twisted by the idea of a beetle humming. I said, well, how can she hear the sound of a beetle? But then I got it. It's all vibrational. Everything is vibrating. Everything is Everything vibrating, is and vibrating. that's wonderful. And I, I love musing on the fact that the Big Bang isn't something that happened 14,000 years ago only. Mm -hmm. It is ongoing. We yes. live in an expanding universe, and it's when the Big Bang began, it began everywhere. From every single point that is now, it is still yes. happening. Yes. And so I like thinking about things like that. Okay, so we have about nine minutes, so that's all. You, that's all. But uh, so let's fill them with poems. Nine minutes. Nine, nine, nine is better than five. <laughs> oh my gracious, my. All right. Um, well then, I have to do some serious selection. All right, this is um, inspired by a beautiful, diminutive, little tiny flower, wayside flower that grows um, in meadows, and it's very small and very easy to overlook. It's called Storksbill geranium. And oh, it's a little oh. tiny, tiny flower head, beautiful pink, and it has these amazing seed pods oh. that resemble a storksbill, or yeah. it's all, also called heronsbill geranium. The Latin name is Erodium secutarium, or, or <laughs> anyway. That'll yes. do for now. And it has this unique, its seeds have a unique adaptation oh. where they're able to coil into a spiral when it exposed to humidity or moisture, which enables them to burrow into the soil to self-plant themselves. Mm. And when it's dry conditions, they straighten into a nail. I mean, that is as straight as this beak here. So anyway, this poem is called Storksbill, did you want those? Okay. Storksbill geranium. <laughs> Storksbill geranium. Wild they grow along the wayside, tiny flowers with long pointed beaks like a stork, wading between red stems, filled with leaves of green cut lace, their silken petaled faces flushed pink like the cheeks of dawn. So small, they're easy to overlook, unless one bows down searching for the unseen, which often brings me to my knees. Yeah. What drives the logging? Sometimes the dry plateau seems endless, the spell of loneliness unbreakable. Yet still my heart beats steady as a seal under ice, sure of finding a breathing hole. Or like the brown Argus butterfly fluttering low over the ground, certain to light upon a flower filled with honey nectar like the one before me now. Spring launched, coiling and uncoiling, like a question unfolding into its own answer. The stork's bill seed spirals and straightens its way through the darkness, determined to keep the future in flower. It never doubts it will find its way, welcomes both moisture and dryness as a means to delve deeper. When the rains come, it spirals into a corkscrew 
When it's dry, it straightens into a nail to burrow into the earth. In my dream the other night, I was walking down a flight of stairs when I said to myself, remember, you're only dreaming this. Who is it that remembered? When she awakens, I'd like to meet her. It said a single strand of DNA, if uncoiled, will reach from here to the moon. So many strands in the braided tress of, tresses of our cells, why sail only as far as there? And so I point my storksbill seed to the breathing hole of sky and uncoil my seed dreams into the honey nectar of the heart to take root and flower. I know it's not possible to fall out of grace only into forgetfulness, flowers overlooked when attention is elsewhere. May I kneel at the feet of this moment and feel the warm arms of love surrounding me and not be dreaming. And will you meet me there? Mm, that's so lovely. And there's so many echoes of, say, Rumi and others in there that I can pick up. Oh, good. Um, it, it's just, it's lovely. And I was glad to find a little more, uh, just a couple of lines of darkness in there, because there's so much light in your poems, but that has to arise out of darkness. So when you spoke of the plateau, you know, and, and, and the feeling of, you know, maybe it won't work, and then you discover in a little flower that it will, that's a very good balancing act. And also the business of the answer and the question intertwined like that, whoo, that gets my mind spinning. So four minutes, let's see what we can do. I'll read this really fast. Huh. No, no, oh, no. Well, no. no, this is a, yeah. in a very different vein and has plenty of darkness, so you okay. like it. <laughs> it's called The Hero's Journey. On The Hero's Journey, there are many obstacles, platitudes to surmount, chasms, chasms of criticism to cross, ice shafts of isolation to melt, silver slanted reelings of the heart to navigate, dungeons of self-doubt to unlock, beasts of betrayal to disarm, monsters of mind's machinations to tame with song, repelling down the sharp slopes of reason and wading across the sticky swamp of sorrow, I press onward. To the bristled guardians of the gate, I offer the password consciousness, and they let me pass. Before me beckons the cave of awakening where love's sweet song is flowing like a river, bringing solace to my spirit as it wafts from deep within. Who is playing, I ask? Every cell in my body answers. Wow, I love that. It's kind of like a cosmic board game. <laughs> it's yeah. just charming. Right. Let's see what we can do in three minutes. Okay, this was inspired by an old grandmother oak who had a hole through her trunk. Uh, tunnel through a trunk. There are portals everywhere. Even in the weather beaten and gnarled, there are openings that offer a way through. Holiness surrounds the hollow that is so heavy with history. Unsling your pack. Take out the non-essentials. Bring only what you need, the willingness to bend and feel the tenderness of the light. Mm. I would put that on my wall or on my mirror because those are words that we definitely need. Let's keep going with these. Oh, um, good. With, time with for these another? short exhortations. Okay. Um, I was sitting at Water's Edge at Muir Beach uh, one foggy afternoon, windy, blustery day, and two ravens came and lit down on the sand next to me and inspired this poem. Ravens at Muir Beach. Raven comrades stood steadfast by me amid prying wind and crashing waves on shifting sand as I knelt in benediction. You mend the broken heart of the world one heartbeat at a time. For millions of years waves have crashed upon these rocks, I overheard the father say to his young son as they passed by. That's why this beach is so beautiful. I dipped my hand into the wave splash foam and brought my fingers to my lips. And that is it. That, we have like one minute, but we're not going to try to cram a poem into that one minute. So, you know, I wouldn't mind if you read that one again. Which one? The one you just read, because oh. I want to hear it one more time. The Raven one? Robert Bly always did that. He did that, um, because there are some lines in that I just want to hear again, if you don't mind doing that. 
the one you just read. Only because you insist. Otherwise, okay. I'd rather read this one. But I will oh. do this. I will accommodate. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Because I want to pick really, up the line. I've got a really read. fun poem to share, okay, too. So do it. Do it. Ignore me. Do okay. it. Do it. This was written for fun. Okay. If your dancing shoes are too tight, take them off. Run barefoot out the door and leave them for the mice nibbling on the moon. If the dance floor is too crowded, wrap your arms around the next person you see and together watch the walls of the room dissolve. If it's too cold outside, light a fire and dance to the crackle of the flames. If no one else is around, tap your feet, clap your hands, and invite yourself to dance. Then say, I thought you'd never ask. I'm so glad you didn't listen to me. That's all the time we have, and what a great ending. Thank you so much, Andrea Freeman. My pleasure, Nishama. So happy to be here. Thank you.